Amen. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning here at St. Joe First United Methodist Church. I'm so glad to see all of you here, and I'm so glad that you chose to join with us in worship this morning. My name is Kim O'Haver, and I'm serving as worship greeter today. My verse this morning is taken from Psalm 68, and it's verses 3 and 4. May the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord. And as we begin our worship service this morning, let's join together in singing O Four Thousand Tongues. That's number 57 in your hymnals. You may stand if you wish and as you are able. Amen. And now let's affirm our faith together this morning. Please turn in the back of your hymnals, or you may follow along on the screen with number 881, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning, church family. We're so happy you chose to worship with us either in person or online. Before we get started today, we just want to give you a few announcements today. First off, if you have not already filled one out, we have our connection and our prayer cards. Those can be found in the pews in front of you. The connection cards are just so we have the most accurate and up-to-date information for you, whether you worship with us for the first, second, 124th time. We are so happy to get as much updated information. And our prayer cards is so we as a church staff can be praying for you, your friends, your family, because we love to be praying for you in any situation. I want to remind all of our middle school, high school, and pre-K through fifth grade friends that Stoke Youth Group and Spark Kids Club are taking a little bit of a break. Spark will start up after the 11th. Stoke will start up on the 11th. So enjoy the little bit of free time. The night's off. But we look forward to kicking those off in the fall. If you want to help with any of those, please, I'd love to sit down and talk to you and see where you can get plugged in. Thank you so much to everyone who signed up for the altar committee. We are so excited to get you serving, and we just need a few more people for this awesome ministry. If you have any questions about it, what they do, what that will look like for you, contact Meg Rogers or Dan. We are having a group going down to the Midwest Mission Distribution Center. This trip is from the 11th through the 13th of September. It's a great trip. You go down, you serve for a few days. I've gone myself. It's a wonderful experience helping building personal dignity and hygiene kits, helping to build desks out of old bleacher wood. And it's just a great way to serve with people from the church and get to know them better. So if you would like more information or join that trip, reach out to Barb Petsky. She can get you all the information you need for that. Fall Festival, my favorite thing ever, one of our biggest outreach events of the year is coming up so soon, Sunday, October 9th from 3 to 7 p.m. If you want to volunteer, contact me. I'll get you plugged in somewhere. We need tons of people helping out with this event. It is going to be so awesome. Start thinking about that, how you can help, how you can donate, and get it on your calendars. Also want to remind everybody that fall kickoff is happening Sunday, September 11th. We're going to have an extra large coffee time, so come hungry, come early for you guys at the 11 o'clock. Uh, but this is just how we kick off and highlight all the ministries that we do. Um, also, we'll be putting together a ministry fair video for that. If you head up a ministry and would like that to be involved or included in that, please reach out to me by the Wednesday before that. That way I can get everything set and ready to go. Soup Kitchen is looking for just a few more volunteers to help Monday, September 12th from 11 to 1. If you have any questions about that, contact Elaine Graves or Darcy Baskins. And thank you so much to all of our wonderful people that are constantly helping in so many different ways around the church. Now let's worship together. Good morning. We're going to continue to worship together by singing My Jesus, I Love Thee, which is number 172 in your hymnal, and you can remain seated during this.
Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are a good God, that you're an intricate God, that you're three persons in one singular God, and we can't even fathom how good and how deep you are. Lord, we thank you for all the freedom that we have. Thank you that we're able to come here every Sunday morning and just worship you and learn more about you and draw closer to you. Thank you that we have the freedom to do that without worrying about anything that we can come here and this is a safe place for us. Thank you for the weather, whether it may be sunny or cloudy. You made all of the weather and we love all of it. And we thank you that fall is just around the corner where we get to experience all of your beautiful creation with different colors and the weather cooling down and we're so excited for that. Lord, we thank you that you love us even though we don't necessarily deserve it. You created us, and so you just love us. That's how it is, and we thank you that no matter what we do, you will continue to love us and know that you just want to be with us. Thank you that you continue to offer grace and mercy, but you also continue to offer truth. Help us to accept the truth even when it's hard even when it may go against what we are thinking at the time, maybe it goes against what we're doing at the time, help us to accept the truth and know the truth. Help us to always come to you with no matter what our issues may be, even if we don't have any issues, help us to come to you and know that we can be comfortable and trust you with anything, God. You're the only person that we can actually trust 100% with everything. You know us better than we know even ourselves. We thank you for that. Lord, we pray for anyone who's in need of healing. We know people in our own congregation in need of physical healing or spiritual healing, mental he healing. And we pray for those people, God. We ask that you touch them in a spiritual way, that you just give them what they need. Thank you that you know exactly what needs to be fixed, even if doctors don't. So God, we ask that you heal people in this congregation, outside of this congregation, across the world, and that through that, people know who you are better, and that they come to see you, Jesus, and follow you. And we pray for those people that just don't know you, whether it be inside of here, outside, and across the world, we pray for those people. We pray for the salvation of the world. We want heaven to be as full as possible. We want to see so many people in heaven. So we ask that you just continue to reveal yourself to people who might not know you, that you reveal yourself in different ways and that you open people's eyes to you. You open their hearts, soften their hearts so that they're able to even recognize you. God, we thank you that you reveal yourself to us, that you make it possible to even have salvation, to have a relationship with you. Help, help us to show people who you are, work through us, to bring people to you. Do your ministry through us, God. This is about your glory and your kingdom and your ministry, and thank you that we even get to be a part of it. Help us to serve others inside our own little circles and inside of our community and all across the world. Help us to be helping people, to be generous people, to be loving people, caring people. Everything that you want us to be, help us to stand for the truth. Grow us in many different ways, in different ways that we don't even know we need to grow in. We want to be more like you every single day. We don't want to stay how we are. God, we ask that you just speak to us today in a different way, that you open our hearts, and that you show us more of who you are, and that we walk out of this room as different people, enlightened with more truth about you, God. Thank you that we get to know you through your word, that we get to know you through your son, through your Holy Spirit, and you're just so good. You do so many different things, and we're so, so thankful for that. Thank you for blessing us every single day with life, with family, with friends, with health, with shelter, with food, with water, with clothing. We're so blessed in so many different ways, and so many people don't even have half of what we have. Help us to realize how blessed we are. Thank you that you come to us, that we're able to talk to you about anything. 
Thank you for the power of prayer, that you work through prayer, you listen to us. Even though some people don't even listen to us when we're in person together, you always listen to us, God. And we're so thankful for that. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us how to pray and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please enjoy this special music. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your gifts with us this morning. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me 
than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. If you knew the preaching schedule, you would know that I'm not supposed to be here today, but I'm helping fill in and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I had to pray about it. Ask Barb. She heard me talking about it. She's not even here now. Uh, um, anyhow, I want to thank Savannah for, and Kim and Sarah for helping me this morning. Bach always soothes my soul, so I don't know about you, but I'm <laughs> a little better after that piece. Thank you, Sarah. This morning, um, I'm finishing up and I'm going to deal with the end of our series on 2 Corinthians. And so I picked up the scripture that was supposed to be, and the first thing I'll just say is, this is a difficult passage, if you didn't <laughs> notice already. And so as I've been studying it and working with it, I was like, okay, the point is weakness and strength. We're going to approach this in my weakness, <laughs> and hopefully God's strength will give us a message. Um, there are so many things going in our world. We all have been reminded through COVID, we all have a weakness. Um, you turn on the news, I don't know about you, but I just read that 12, over 1,200 people have died in Pakistan in floods this last week. What do you do? I'm weak. I don't have anything to do for them. People are dying in Russia and Ukraine. Why? I, do have an, I, I don't have an answer except for that we're in a fallen world and we're going to be a mess until Jesus comes back. I look at our own economy and I, the economy, that's a good word, weakness to me is a good <laughs> But for some people, it's a strength. So we will um, talk through this passage, but I just want you to constantly keep those ideas of weakness and strength because I'll tell you the end of the sermon already. In our weakness, he is strong. And we get our strength through God. And when we get our strength through God, we are strong. So a few years ago, a member of my family took a group of our family to one of these places called an escape room center. It's a game. Have you ever done that, anyone? All right, you actually pay money to go to a place <laughs> that puts your group in a room and you work for about 45 minutes to an hour following clues about a theme, whatever your room is. Sometimes it's a murder mystery, sometimes it's just you find the golden treasure or something. But you work through all these clues and you unlock all these boxes and hopefully before the time runs out, you find the key and can unlock the door and escape. And that's the point. So, um, you know, it's ways we play games now, I guess. <laughs> um, one of the first issues I noticed playing this game is um, you have to figure out who are you going to listen to? So if you're in a group room with eight people or 10 people, how many? And you have to go, okay, oh, it's the, we're gonna look here. And someone else say, oh, well, look over here. And the, you invariably have one person who already unlocked one of the boxes on their own. And you have to come together or else it just does not work. So you have individual, individual personalities that show up. There are coaches, oh, we can all do this. There are questers, I know what's the right way to do this. 
the inspectors, hmm, let's observe everything before we do anything. The problem solvers, well, we know this, but what about that? <laughs> the individualists, I can do this on my own. <laughs> the caretakers, oh, let's all get along, you know. <laughs> the list goes on. You, you can kind of go there. So it's a lethal mix. <laughs> but ultimately, it's supposed to be fun. <clears throat> Especially if you survive and you get the key and you unlock the door. Then you get, sometimes you get a t-shirt that says, I escaped wherever. This is um, a great game for most people. And, it's, and um, it's fun for family dynamics. But it also shows strengths in the group and the weaknesses in the group. And to me, it's a, also an image of the church. We're no different than a group trying to go through life together, following Christ, and we have understandings, but who are we gonna to listen to? Who's the problem solver? Who's the individualist? How are we gonna to work together? And we all have our strengths to offer and we have our weaknesses. And as we work together, we get the key <laughs> and we get eternal life. So today, as we finish this series, um, we're aware that Paul was not only up against personalities and issues with personalities, but he was up against spiritual error. Um, so basically this summer we've discussed all of 2 Corinthians. And I, as you've heard several times, there are at least, can, most people, can, uh, scholars consider that there were at least four letters that Paul wrote to Corinthians because there, there was such a struggle. There was dissension in the group and uh, just a growing, growing amount of issues and so he constantly wrote them to keep them engaged with him but also with each other. Paul had planted this church, fed it, suffered for it, and as we close this book, we see um, that he struggles with their issues to the end. There's no difference for us in this, in our own walk, in our own journey. We struggle, um, we battle not against flesh and blood, as he says later in Ephesians, we battle against principalities of this world. And we're, we are at constantly at a struggle. So we haven't, we, ha we don't reach the goal until we are in the next life. So if you remember last week, Pastor Dan talked about being careful what you believe. And um, he talked about Satan being the father of lies and who works to discourage and deceive us. The Corinthian church is a perfect example of this. And we understand how these things affect them, but they also affect us. Both in our church community, but also personally. And these are things we have to work at. And like he said, we have to understand what we believe and how we believe it. So the first thing I wanna look at is that Paul um, helped form this church. They had been formed under his ministry and flourished. When he left to go to other cities and preach or to develop other churches, they um, were overrun by false teachers. The leaders were caught in sinful situations and the disorder in their worship and daily lives was prominent. Again, much like our current situations at times. <laughs> but Paul had written to them to keep strong in their relationship going. But one of, the, one of the worst groups that he had to deal with were these false teachers. <clears throat> this was a group that had taught that they were actually the apostles and that they had um, had the ability to instruct and lead and that Paul was not a true apostle with real spiritual authority. Let's talk a, word, a moment about the word apostle because there's different understandings. Basically, an apostle was a person who had had personal experience with Jesus, had seen him and, that, and was a disciple of his and was able to continue the ministry that he had given to him. Well, Paul, is sometimes called the 13th apostle because the, the disciples were the initial apostles that we think of. 
But Paul had become active on several different levels. I'm going to jump ahead of myself, so I'm going to, I'll bring this up in a minute of why he's the, an apostle. So when the, all these questions that, that are going on in the church, where are we different today? Who can we trust? Where is their truth? And how do we know what to do to be true followers of Christ, which we claim we are? So in this chapter today, Paul begins with a very strange experience. He has defended his apostleship and his calling as one who's had the personal encounter with Christ. So you'll remember in Acts, Paul's name was actually Saul at first. He had been a major leader with the Jewish group, and he was a major persecutor of the Christians. He's the one that stood to the side and held everyone's cloak while they stoned Stephen. And he was proud of it. And he pursued vehemently the, the Christians because he saw them as a relig religious faction and wanted them destroyed. And then he was on the road to Damascus. And what happened? He got knocked off his horse. <laughs> we'll say it that way. Because he had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus came to him and said, what are you doing? And Jesus revealed himself, and he, Peter be, or Paul became blind. And for several days, until he was prayed over and healed with that, but he was, it transformed him, and he was no longer called Saul, he was called Paul. <clears throat> it talks about, both in Acts and in, in this book, that when he talks about being in the spirit 14 years ago, we it's considered that that 14 year period was a time when he was taught and instructed. And he says the Holy Spirit's the one that taught him. And Jesus had come to him personally. So this is one reason why he was able to claim himself to be an apostle, because he actually saw Jesus and God had trained him for this new, this new um, way of teaching and understanding the scripture. <clears throat> So he changed his name to Paul to signify that he was no longer the person he had been. <clears throat> he stepped back from the spotlight and was instructed and established as a leader over 14 years from his conversion. He states that the Holy Spirit was his instructor and the early church leaders verified his conversion and his calling. That was the main significant thing. Um, it's what gave him a lot of authority. Paul had a significant role in helping in this, to establish and guide several of the early churches, many of the early churches. Most of the epistles or letters in the New Testament are Paul's writing to these various churches, and Corinth is one of them. So, and I've said, said this before, those letters that make up over half the New Testament are letters from Paul, and this is where we get most of our theology from, because he clarifies things that were said either in, from the Old Testament or from even the teachings of Jesus. So in this last letter to the Corinthians, he has had to instruct the congregation on church doctrine. We've talked about that weeks ago. <laughs> he had to rebuild bridges where several people who were offended. He had to encourage them in the giving to newer congregations. He was taking, they were taking an offering for the new congregations in, in the area. And then he had to defend his ministry and role now you would think that's kind of a crazy list. Here he is trying to instruct them. He's trying to befriend them. He's trying to encourage them, give, have them be generous. But then he's also having to defend what he's doing. What's the difference today? <laughs> it's just the same thing in, in, in that we always want to know where is it? And this is a good thing. For, this goes along with last week. What is true? What, where is God in this? And we want to follow Jesus. And our hearts have, there's one of the things that I just love in, in, in some of the teachings of the Holy Spirit is that we come together as a Christian body. And because we come, we bring the Holy Spirit with us. And the Holy Spirit ministers to each other, of us without us even knowing it. The fact we're sitting here together, we're one in, we're one in the Spirit. And the body of Christ is gathered here. And there's a ministry that goes on to us. It's one reason it's good to go to church. 
you can, hopefully you feel when you leave, your spirit's been lifted. Part of it's just being together with the family of God as a part of the body of Christ. So Paul's trying to teach all that, and he's going through the same struggles we, I think we understand. So, today we have to look at basically his final defense about his apostleship, being a living witness of Jesus and his spiritual authority of coming from God's calling. So he gets pushed because these false teachers have said, Paul's a fake. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times when we have people say, they're, why would you listen to so-and-so? They're a fake. And you have to check. You have to try the spirit. That's what Dan was talking about last week, because there are people who say something wrong. But Paul had been effective with them for over almost 15 years at this point. And they'd known him. And now they're, they're saying, well, we're not sure if you're really an apostle. And he's like, what? And they said, well, you haven't shown us any signs and wonders. You haven't given us any demonstration that you've had some supernatural experience. So the first part of this verse, chapter goes on, and he meets this, these accusations head on. Not wanting to boast, but being put in a position to share spiritual experiences that are difficult to understand. Paul describes a supernatural experience, a strength, but it's difficult to put it into words. Have you all ever, I, you don't need to raise your hand, <laughs> but have you had an experience that's so deep to you spiritually that you, you can only, if you share it, you only share it with a few friends. Because other people would say, well, either <laughs> we might need to be <laughs> checking you in somewhere, or you just had a great emotional experience. That's a lot of times what's mar uh, marked up for. So it, the emotional side can come, come but <laughs> as I will witness, Sometimes God does touch our emotions, and our emotions are part, of, are part of our being. And so when our emotions are touched, that's a great thing, but that's not our motivation. Anyhow, Paul says, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained by this. I'm going to go ahead and boast, but I will share you visions and revelations of the Lord, but it's only because you're all pushing for it. <laughs> and then... Instead of addressing it as himself, he talks about, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago who was caught up in the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. Well, at this point, it's easier for him to talk about his experience as another person than to address it as himself. So this is him 14 years ago, caught up in the spirit. And he describes this in the third person so as not to draw attention to himself. And he's sharing his own timeline and experience of being taken to the third heaven. So there's different ways you can interpret this. But the main way I understand is the first heaven's considered basically where we are. I mean, you look up there, this is the clouds, the air we breathe. The second heaven is outer space. It's beyond where, we, where, the, where the astronauts go. <laughs> Or the Hubble. The third heaven is the spiritual heaven that we can't see and we can't get to on our own. And over the years, there are our critics and, and ones who will say, "There's no such thing as another heaven." You know, when G the, and they they use that even to say, "What happened to Jesus when he ascended? Where did he go?" And one of my favorite um, responses from a very dear friend of mine said, is, he created time and space. <laughs> he went back to what he created. We, don't have, we can't comprehend. That Paul couldn't explain what he had experienced. We can't comprehend some of these things, but Jesus went to be in the heavens. I, I, believe, I believe he's alive today. That's why we're standing here, or I'm standing here, you're sitting here. <laughs> so we have to claim these things and know, know the truth. So anyhow, Paul went to God's presence. And I know that this man, whether in body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. He was caught up in paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. Paul can hardly explain the experience himself. He doesn't know if he was just having a vision or if he was literally taken bodily 
But what, what, he, what happened is he saw a glimpse of heaven beyond description. Others in the Bible have had this experience that they've written about. I think of Daniel in the Old Testament. You know, Daniel, is, here's a perfect example of a person in weakness and strength. He was a captive, taken as a slave to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now I'm going to get into my weakness of emotion. <laughs> But so if I get weepy, we'll just keep going. But he was brought into the king's court. He and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace. Some people don't know these stories, which is so sad. They're brought into the king's court. He wants to feed them from his table, and they say, no, we'll follow our laws. And they proved to be healthier, and it got the king's attention. And then it got the king's attention that Joseph could enter, or Joseph, well, that's another dream. <laughs> we'll get there another time. But Daniel could interpret dreams. So then he became the, the interpreter of that, of that for Belshazzar, which wasn't a good thing for Belshazzar because it was the, his end. But David wrote, or, that's another one, but we'll get there later. <laughs> Daniel rose in stature to become the second command of the whole kingdom. Now, Here's a person brought in weakness, but look where God brought him to strength. And he ended up caring for his people and brought favor to the king enough that Darius said, okay, you can go back to Jerusalem. And, if not, and so not maybe with him, but, but it, he prepared the way. I also think of John the Apostle, John the beloved disciple. He was, they tried to kill him. They tried to execute him. They tried to burn him in oil. <laughs> they, they, they stoned him, and he wouldn't die. <laughs> and God had him, they exiled him then to Patmos. Well, you, they thought, well, we're done with him. So what does he do on the book, on the Isle of Patmos? He writes the book of Revelation. <laughs> so in, his, in what looks like weakness, there's God's strength meeting us again. And he, I mean, the book of Revelation is one of those things, you read it and you're like, I don't get any of this. This is the same thing with Paul here, okay? He, he, was, he just saw something that was beyond description. All have seen, all have a difficult time who've seen things like this to, experience, to ex explain that experience. Or they're not permitted to share. <laughs> In Revelation, it, John's told, don't, don't write this down. John Wesley, our beloved John Wesley, <laughs> stated it this way. What Paul experienced was not possible to express in human language. It was beyond description. But his experience was so profound that it sustained and carried Paul through his years of ministry with times of persecution and trials. So if you can imagine having such a vision, when he's shipwrecked and about to die on the Isle of Miletus, when he's bitten by a snake, He's got that vision knowing where he's headed. And it makes the persecution much lighter, I think. There's the strength. We all have been given a vision of something, and you have to hold on to it. One of my, the sweetest moments, here's my tears, is when I was at that conference in Berlin, and this nun turns to Esther and says, oh, honey, stay close to Jesus. He wants to do something great for you, through you. Well, that's a word for all of us. I, and that's a, that's a word for us today. Stay close to Jesus. He wants to do something great through you, even in your weakness. So, um, <clears throat> so then Paul goes on. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself because of my weaknesses. So he's again trying to keep himself out of the limelight of it. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrained so that no one will think more of me than is warranted or I, what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Paul is turning from the greatness of this experience and its significance for him as an apostle to turning his back to the thought of humility. Turning, turning back to the thought of humility. His goal is not to get approval or admiration. The vision is beyond that and leads us to this next point. 
Paul could have become extremely proud at this point. If he, because he could list his, if you read, and we've talked about that in this, in this series. Paul was the, the Jew, the highest Jew of the Jewish. He was in the top tribe. He was in the top group and everything. And he had studied with the top teachers. He, he was the best of all of that. And he said he considered it nothing that, so that he could know who Jesus was. And so with this point of vision and stuff, he's now on level with Daniel and others in the Old Testament. Now I can say David and Joseph. But that put him at a level that he could have become extremely difficult. <laughs> but instead, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. <laughs> There's the sermon, see ya. <laughs> Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. After such a spiritual mountaintop, seeing heaven, God, all of that, Paul is plunged back into human reality. <laughs> and by given, being given the thorn in the flesh, a tormenting issue, it keeps him humble. We have no idea what it was. People have talked about ever since he wrote the words, what could it be, what could it be? I mean, there are people still say, what do you think it is? There are hundreds of answers. It, it, um, <clears throat> some scholars and interpreters, there, like I said, there are many theories. Some think it's physical. Some think it might be emotional. Some think it's a spiritual issue, but we won't know. But it was a problem enough that Paul asked the Lord to remove it. And the crux of the issue is God basically said no. But God didn't say, no, you're at the end. He said no, but my grace is sufficient. Paul takes this answer and accepts this position of weakness. It is in his weakness that God is really seen as he is able to continue. Paul is able to continue the ministry God's called him to in spite of this, this thorn. So I'm going to go back to John Wesley because I kind of like him at times. <laughs> and he said a beautiful thing on this. We see there may be grace where there is the quickest sense of pain. This is for all of us. When we are in pain, we, we can see, that usually opens our eyes to see grace. My strength is more illustriously displayed by the weakness of the instrument. God's grace is more obvious in our weakness. Therefore, I will glory in my weakness rather than in my revelations that the strength of Christ may rest upon me. And the strength of Christ resting on me in the Greek phrase means the grace of Christ may cover me like a tent. Now, if you've been camping, which several people did a few weeks ago at the family camp, we want to be under a tent. <laughs> because it covers us completely. It protects us. It keeps us from being bothered by pests or other critters. It can also be a fun place where we gather. And to think that that grace of God is a tent where we can be protected, but we can fellowship is meaningful to me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I find that encouraging. Whatever issue I'm contending with, the Lord will give me strength or grace to be sustained, and that grace will cover me like a tent. So after all this, Paul ends with, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul makes his final point here. God's grace is made perfect in weakness, not in our glorious experiences, 
Paul might have been sustained by his revelationary moment, the revelation moment, but he was actually maintained by God's grace and it's a constant availability. God didn't say, when you need it, then there will be grace. He said, my grace is sufficient. And in the Greek, again, it means it's there now. It was there and it will be there. So I go back to the earlier questions. <laughs> Where are we different today? We aren't any different. We have the same struggles. We need to stay active in our relationship with Christ, care about clear beliefs, live our lives as a fragrance of the gospel of Christ, live generously, guard against false teachings, and thinking and living in God's grace. Who can we trust? It might sound too simple, but we can trust God. <laughs> How do we stay connected? Prayer, devotions, having a daily moment even, just to recognize there's someone bigger than me who's a lot better, <laughs> better and can help me. And worship. It's in a, it's, uh, people who, who sometimes walk away from worship don't realize that they've, they've missed one of, their, one of the sweet opportunities of being in God's presence. Where is their truth? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We can stay connected to Jesus, keeping our eyes on him and relying on his grace to strengthen us. So that how do we know what to do to be a true follower of Christ? Well, we turn to God constantly. And he's always with us, always ready to accept us. It's easy to have heard people say, oh, you know, you do that, God's going to leave you. <laughs> Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you to the end of the earth. That's how Mary could turn him. And say, I know that my redeemer lives. And I'll see him on that day. And that's the day that Paul saw in his vision. So what are problems? <laughs> Dissents and disagreements, pain and separations. For me, like I said, these issues that are going on in the world, they swirl around us. What can you do? There are times when the Lord instructs us and shows us what to do. Sometimes it's, it's giving to UMCOR because <laughs> they do have presence around the world. One of the greatest tools that we forget as Christians is prayer. I, I think one of my favorite stories in the New Testament is when Peter is stuck in prison and they're having a prayer meeting for him and they're saying, oh, God delivered Peter and there's an earthquake and Peter's delivered and he comes to the door, knocks on the door and they said, oh, go to the door, someone's, someone's there. The girl runs to the door, opens it up and it's Peter and she goes back, you can't be here and she runs back and says to the people, it's Peter, it can't be Peter, we're praying for him. It, that's, the, that's what we miss. We cannot give up this tool. And even if it, I think God lets us sometimes have struggles and we're human. Everyone has their weakness. Everyone has a thorn somehow. But that's the, that's the piece that has, keeps us keeping our eyes focused on Jesus versus going, I can take care of that. Because we're created in, through the fall, we're brought to a point where we think, I can take care of anything. Isn't that the, one of the strongest things when you do something, you go, see, I did that. It's a great moment, but it's short and fleeting, right? But when you all of a sudden look around and you've seen people who are affected by something you might have done in secret, but all of a sudden it's a blessing to others, all of a sudden you've made a different imprint, imprint in life and for eternity. I don't know if that's too vague or too <laughs> obscure, but I can think of a couple ideas and people, but I don't want to go on and on and on. So I'm not going to today. Well, I might in a minute. <laughs> I'm grateful as I look at this congregation, how the Lord's brought us through COVID. I know other churches that closed. I mean, they closed for good. They couldn't make it. And actually, we were, we were strengthened in some ways by COVID. And then that is, that's one of those weaknesses and strengths. And we have to trust the Lord now we don't sit back and go, oh, we made it. <laughs> it's what's next, Lord. Keep us close, Lord, to you so that you can do something great through us.
Paul in his final words of the whole book. This is 2 Corinthians 13. So it's the last chapter, the very end of the book, he does a blessing on the church. And he says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. You know, Paul says rejoice a lot to the church. And I think that's one of the things that we forget to do. We don't rejoice, is be joyful. And how are you joyful? Part of it's being thankful. I don't know about you, but when I have my really big pity parties, which do happen, <laughs> I stop when the Lord kind of gets me and, I, and he reminds me, thank me for things or for whatever. And I start a Thanksgiving list and I thank him for my family. I mean, that's the easy one to start with, right? I thank you, for, thank you, Lord, for my friends. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for each one of these people. And sometimes I name you. <laughs> Thank you for the staff of this church. Thank you for Dan. Thank you for blessing me with the house. Thank you for, and I just start going and all of a sudden I'm walking down the road a different way. <laughs> and I'm all of a sudden, okay, Lord, what's next? And that's the big question for us that we do out of our weakness and our strength. And at the end of this book, okay, Lord, what's next? What can I do in your strength? So he says, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. That means be the body of Christ and love each other. And whoever's out of fellowship, bring them back. If you can. You can't force people, but you can be an open, open to them. Encourage one another. I've had a couple very kind moments this summer of encouragement from people. If either just a kind word or other just demonstrations of cards and just just kindnesses and those encouragements mean everything those put wind in your sails you know because sometimes it's easy to go along and that's true for all of us we you go along you go I hope this is okay <laughs> and then then someone says boy that really meant something well, that means something back, you know, and we just need to be, it's easy, especially in this world with texting and, and calling and everything on a phone or a computer to not think our words are more important. Be of one mind, focus together, be the focus from the mind of Christ. We want the mind of Christ and live in peace. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. That's how he ends the book. This means live in support of one another as a Christian body. Hold each other up in prayer and word. Move forward in agreement of your purpose. Get along with each other no matter what. And God will bless you. And then when we're blessed, what do we do? We become a blessing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for the reminder that in our weakness you are strong. Thank you for sustaining us through times of distress and trouble. Help us to keep our eyes on you. And Lord, bless us to be a blessing and help us to stay close to you that you can do something great through us. In your name we pray, amen. There are two themes that I heard this morning in Jim's wonderful message and in our scripture readings. And those were boasting and pride and humility. And I was thinking of these two things in terms of generosity. There are some who will boast about, oh, I've given this king's ransom to the church. And there are others who give to the church quietly and humbly, and it makes their hearts glad. And I think that is the greatest blessing, is to have humility while being generous. And generosity is talked about many times in the Bible. We're told that those who sow generously will reap generously, that a generous person will prosper, and that a generous man will himself be blessed. 
and we are a blessing to others. Um, as the ushers come forward for our tithes and offerings this morning, let's demonstrate our own generosity. And let's demonstrate it to this church and this community and beyond. Thank you. You may be seated, and please join me in prayer. Father God, please accept our tithes and offerings as our thanks for the mercy, grace, and love that you show us. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy you have given us so much. We pray that you will multiply our gifts given for the building of your kingdom and for your glory. May they be a blessing to many, and may we reflect your love in all that we do. 
We pray in the glorious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, as we bring our service to a close this morning, let's join together in singing our final hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed. It's number 714 in your hymnals, or you may follow along on the screens. And once again, please stand as you wish and as you are able. Now, as you go today, go in the confidence of your weakness, which means you're actually going in God's sufficient grace. Carry with that. Carry with you the sufficient grace that God has for you and go in his peace as you rejoice. Amen.